Hello, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go for an example for a brand new company. And we're going to look at the valuation for such a firm, which is in a transition phase. First, we're going to take a look at the historic financial statement. And based on this, we can do some calculations, uh, particularly looking at the financial ratios and the growth rate over time to see whether or not a firm fits into the stable growth model or the transition growth model. For standing desk, this is almost visible just by eyeballing the changes from year to year. It grows from 449,000 to 850,000 and then to 1.325 million dollars. So it is doubling and growing at an exponential rate. Uh, for companies that are not as obvious, you can definitely compute uh, the growth rate from year to year. Um, and that's actually the, the better way to, to do that. And you want to also uh, be able to identify the key financial ratios that you want to compute to, to determine if a company belongs to the stable growth or a transition growth. So uh, a couple of um, metrics that you may want to uh, consider is the growth rate for different financial ratios. For example, um, we mentioned the growth rate for revenue. Uh, you may also want to take a look at the growth rate for um, EBITDA. So these are just suggestions. This, there are no rules to uh, valuation. Remember that valuation is more of an art than a science. So you really need to have experience, but these are just some suggestions that you can, you can take a look at. So uh, to compute a growth rate, we take the new divided by the old minus one. So that will give us a growth rate for year zero to year one, and then from year one, minus one to year minus two. So you can see that the growth rate here, as we mentioned, is almost doubling. So not, uh, you, confirm, you confirm our intuition or our eyeballing that the growth rate was 90% and it went down to 55%. If you look at um, EBITDA, again, look at the growth rate for EBITDA, uh, it, is even more astounding um, and in here it doesn't make sense because EBITDA was negative and it goes to positive so this is it this is not meaningful um, but just based on a quick analysis of these two uh, two uh, growth rates we can safely conclude that this company is not in a stable period it's definitely in a transition period and therefore you can just you you your best uh, model to use for this firm is the transition model now that we know which model to use, next is to look at what adjustments we make. We need to make. Um, here are the information that is given. So again, all, again, always um, clearly label your assumptions and the sources of those assumptions. Uh, in this particular um, template, I did not include some of the more commonly used formulas, and I want you to develop the habit of um, including documentation for your own model. So first of all, um, we know that the current management salary is $100,000. And this is, again, the story of this company is detailed described in the textbook. Uh, so basically, a uh, manager is typically is taking a less than um, market rate because they are hoping the company will grow. And as you seek additional funding, particularly from outsider, um, you as manager, as the entrepreneur, uh, you want your efforts to be rewarded. And you may also have to hire professional management. Therefore, you want to include market level management salary and make that adjustment. And so in this particular, and again, we have a low estimate and then high estimate, and we take into account, uh, so we just use the average in our base case. So in this case, the adjustment is a downward adjustment because your current amount is $100,000, whereas the new amount is going to be $160,000. So you're going to increase, you're going to have to pay 
um, an additional $60,000. In addition to that, they believe um, going forward, they would have to increase in associated uh, benefits for management. So here we have to, um, again, this is, a, this is a negative adjustment, meaning that we have to pay more money. So altogether, um, our adjustment to EBIT is $63,500 um, in the base case. Here we want to, um, and we can copy this across to the other two. Again, if you put in the correct uh, absolute reference. So here um, in our worst case, um, we will have to um, adjust downward by $85,000. In our best case, we adjust it downward from $42,000. Our current projection for year zero, again here is uh, from table 10-4, so we can pick that up. Our projection for year zero EBITDA is $345,600. And when we make the adjustment, we have to take that into account. So the best case, so here you want to think about it. Um, this is our low estimate. This is our high estimate. The best case is actually based on the low estimate because uh, in the best case, uh, we don't have to adjust downward as much as we would. So in the best case, uh, we take the adjustment of $42,000. In the worst case, we have to adjust downward a lot more. So we will have to take the $85,000 as our adjustments. So here we have our adjusted EBITDA for year zero, and we have the expected um, scenario, the best case scenario, and the worst case scenario. In this template, I specifically break each small component down into its own page to um, make the explanation a lot uh, easier and for you to understand each individual steps in estimating the discounted cash flow value using the transition period model. When you are building your own model, you would probably want to combine all these multiple steps, so these various tables, into a single large model so that it's easier for you to do scenario analysis and sensitivity analysis. Okay, now we finish our first step, which is to adjust the um, Histor uh, the, the base year, year zero EBITDA. The next step is to project this future cash flows. So let's move on to the next table. Once again, we have the assumptions and the consumptions are clearly labeled. You, I did not put in here any notation. Again, this is to encourage you to um, write your own documentation. So for example, how do you compute projected future um, EBITDA? So basically what you would do here, you will, so to write your label, you want that to start with a uh, string or a text in Excel. And you can start in, uh, a documentation, including symbols, equal signs, and additions and subtraction signs by including a, um, hypo um, a quotation mark as your first um, entry. So this is equal to last year's, so you can say period EBITDA times one plus the growth rate. So we have the projected growth rate here. So this is year one. So the first base year is year zero. And so you may want to, in addition to that, give yourself a hint and say that the year zero EBITDA is from table 10.5. It is important for you to, to uh, develop good documentation uh, hygiene or habit as you create models. This is a simple model, it's very small with very few formulas. Some of them are well understood, but as you go to work and you develop more complex model and you're working in a team, you need to clearly document your work so that each team member can pick up the model that you create and use it effectively. So here we have 
So the first year is based on year zero times one plus the growth rate is this year's growth rate. And in year two, we take last year's EBIT plus the current year's growth rate. So once you created the formula for year two, you can look forward and see that indeed um, this formula, if we copy over, will be true. Now we have different growth rate for the next five years. And the reason for that is we decided that for uh, based on our knowledge of the company, we expect that it will have five years of transition year. So this is the second step. The second step is to estimate the free cash flow during the transition years. So after tax cash flow is equal to the before tax cash flow times one minus the tax rate. So again, you'll want to document here. So I'm going to let you write it on your own. So uh, practice documentation. So write down the formula that you use. And now we have cash flow for the next five years. The next thing we need to do is to compute the reinvestment rate. So again, make sure that you write down a documentation here so that you will know how to compute that. Uh, if you don't remember, you can look it up in your book. And once you look it up in your book, then you want to write it down here so you don't have to memorize it. I happen to have it memorized and the reinvestment rate is equal to the growth rate divided by the ROA. And the growth, uh, the reinvestment rate in um, year one is over 100%. Let's take a look at that and, and think about what does it mean. Having a reinvestment rate of 100, over 100% means that you're investing more than after-tax cash flow from operations. And that is not surprising for a fast-growing firm. And what that implies is the, the equity holder, the entrepreneur, have to keep investing in the business. They may even need to bring in an outsider um, to seek additional equity funding. And that is probably the reason why they are um, doing the valuation here. Uh, the another thing to look at is when your growth rate is uh, higher than your ROA, that means you're growing faster than the return that you can generate from the existing asset. And therefore, you need external funding. And this is, um, we can copy this over the next five years. Again, I want to remind you to put your document here so that you have your formula. Um, so this company is still going through some transition years. So it is investing heavily for a couple of years and is slowly transitioning to a more stable state. Um, reinve reinvestment, again, I'm going to walk through that, but I'm, you really should write down the formula here so that later on when you go back to look at your, your notes, um, your spreadsheet will become your notes, you'll have that information easily available to you so you can use it to build your own model, whether or not it's for a case or later on for, or later on for work. So reinvestment is equal to um, after-tax cash flow times the reinvestment rate. And free cash flow to equity holder is after-tax cash flow from operation minus reinvestment. Uh, an implicit assumption here is that the company used no debt. Um, we, we To keep this model more simple and for you to keep track of what's going on, we assume that the company is not going to borrow money over the next five years. If the company does borrow money, um, we went over how to do that in the constant growth model um, in the last exercise. Okay, now let's copy this over the next five years. So we have, we, now we completed step um, three, where we have the ca uh, cash flow, free cash flow forecast during the transition year. So we have free cash flow from year one through year five. The next step is to compute the terminal value uh, that the company uh, is estimating past its transition years. 
since the computer terminal value we'll need uh, we'll use the perpetual growth formula and to do that we need to know the discount rate so before we can compute the terminal value we have to compute the cost of equity again we're using cost of equity because we are estimating free cash flow to equity holders now in this particular case since we are assuming zero debt um, the free cash flow to equity holders is the same as free cash flow to the firm because it doesn't use any borrowing all right, let's go to table 10.7 where we'll compute the cost of equity. Here I included the formula because these are relatively long formula and it's not something that is used by uh, people all the time. But if, if you don't have, a, if when you are creating your own model, make sure that you include this there. And, and I'll be looking for that when I look at your case um, spreadsheet as well. Okay, so unlevel cost of equity, we say that's equal to, to the um, risk-free rate plus the be unlevel beta times the market return minus the risk-free rate. Next, we have the unsystematic risk uh, premium, which is equal to beta. So again, that's equal to um, B7 times the unsystematic risk adjustment factor times the market risk premium, which is the difference between the market return minus the risk free rate. And the cost of equity is equal to uh, the unlevered cost of equity plus financial risk premium plus the liquidity premium plus the unsystematic risk premium. Okay, now that we have the cost of equity, we are ready to compute the terminal value. Let's move on to table 10.8. To compute the terminal value, we need some additional assumptions. Uh, the three additional assumptions that we need are the long-term stable growth rate. This is the growth rate that we assume will, uh, the firm can achieve for the rest of its life, uh, as well as the firm's long-term tax rate and also the term's long-term return on asset. Okay, with that, we can compute the terminal value. Uh, so the projected adjusted EBIT, uh, EBITDA, so this is the EBITDA for year six, notice here. So that's equal to year five, our uh, projected adjusted EBITDA. And here I have a hint saying that that's from table 10.6. So we can start this formula, go to table 10.6, pick up the ad uh, adjusted EBITDA for year six. I'm sorry, year five times one plus the growth rate and the growth rate is the long-term growth rate. So long-term stable growth rate of 3%. Uh, the after-tax cash flow is the same as what we did before. So this is year six. So this is equal to the EBITDA times one minus the tax rate. And the reinvestment rate is equal to uh, the long-term growth rate divided by the return on asset. Uh, it makes sense that the long-term reinvestment rate will be quite a bit lower uh, than before. And the reinvestment is equal to the after-tax cash flow times the reinvestment rate. Okay. And the free cash flow to equity holders will be the after-tax cash flow minus the reinvestment. Uh, we'll bring in the cost of equity. Again, you, it, this is from table 10.7. And now we can compute the stable growth terminal value in year five. And so that's equal to free cash flow to equity holders that we just computed for year six divided by the cost of equity minus the long-term growth rate. Now we have computed all the necessary cash flow to compute the um, value for standing desk using the discounted cash flow method. We're going to put all the cash flow together in the next table, table 10.9. So the cash flow for years one through four is um, estimated in table Again, you want to label this uh, in table 10.6. So if you go to table 10.6, here is the cash flow for year one. And we said that's the same for year one through four. But for year five, 
the free cash flow includes the cash flow estimated in table 10.6 plus the terminal value that we estimated. So together, that's our free cash flow for year five. As I mentioned, uh, I break this up into individual tables for um, ease of explanation and make it clear that you're computing each element step by step. When you're creating this model, either for, uh, for work or for your case, you want to put all of them together on one page, um, and that will make it easier for the calculation. You can compute the present value uh, using the net present value method. Uh, one of the things that you want to notice is that this is um, the cash flow starts in year one. So if you compute a net present value here, it will include it will um, the value you computed is the value as of year zero, which is exactly what you want. So in the net present value, the first argument is rate, and the rate here is the discount rate, and the discount rate is the cost of equity. So we computed that in 10.7, so we're going to pick that up. And then the cash flow starting in year one, uh, this three, this five years. So that's our net present value. I also want to use the opportunity to demonstrate um, how to compute present value um, on a yearly basis. Um, you can set up your model so that you can compute present value using the formula quite easily. Um, Excel requires the input in the form of numbers. So if you label your year, year one, two, year one, year two, this is counted as a string and cannot be used in calculation. So you actually need to uh, put your year in uh, numbers. So if you set up your model such that is year one, two, three, four, five, you can use that to compute um, present value. Uh, and the present value formula, once again, um, if you do this all the time, you have it memorized. And if you don't, then you should put that in there. Uh, the present value formula is equal to the future value divided by 1 plus the discount rate. Again, that is the cost of equity. And yeah, raised to the number of years. So in this case, is year one. And you can compute that for each year. So here are the value, the present value of the cash flow based on each year's future cash flow. If you add up all the present value, it should exactly equal to the MPV that, that you computed. So that's another way to check your work. It's always a good idea to compute your, your mod when you're developing your model to double check to make sure that you didn't make any mistakes. Um, the reason why I wanted to um, do this is you can see the contribution to the value from each year. In this particular case, this is a, a firm which a really new firm and it's just starting out, um, a majority of the value, so the value of this firm is $552,000, is based on its terminal value, right? Most of the $552,000 of that, $508,000 comes in from year five. And the majority of the value in year five is the terminal value. So you, you, if you're doing sensitivity analysis, you may want to focus on the sensitivity that has to do with the assumptions in the terminal value. And there's also the area where you have the large, uh, largest degree of uncertainty. The way that I separate this out uh, into multiple uh, tables makes it easy for you to see the step-by-step -step calculation, but it does make doing analysis very challenging because the assumptions are spread out over um, each tab. Um, instead of having a large assumption area uh, where all the assumptions are located, um, the assumptions are spread out throughout um, each table. So this is one of the uh, modeling trade-off that you need to learn. Uh, sometimes including the um, assumption area inside the model makes the model construction a little bit easier. However, it um, 
the downside of that is it makes um, identifying the assumptions a lot trickier. Uh, here you can use color coding to help, um, but when you are creating your own model, eventually you develop your own preference in terms of how you handle your assumptions, your models, and your sensitivity analysis. So if I were creating this model um, with the intention to do sensitivity analysis, instead of with the intention to clearly delineate step by step, I would put all the assumptions in one area, the model in another area that will enable me to do sensitivity analysis a lot easier. This concludes our discussion for evaluation and I'll see you back here in chapter 11. Good luck.